Reverend, with your permission, I'd like to make an announcement. Young man, this is a house of God. I understand that, Reverend. I apologize. The South Carolina militia is being called up. I'm here to enlist every man willing. Son, we are here to pray for the souls of those men hanging outside. Yes, pray for them. But honor them by taking up arms with us. And bring more suffering to this town? If King George can hang those men, our friends, he can hang any one of us. Dan Scott, barely a week ago I heard you rail for two hours about independence. And? Mr. Hardwick, how many times have I heard you speak of freedom at my father's table? Half the men in this church, including you, Father, and you, Reverend, are as ardent patriots as I. Will you now, when you are needed most, stop at only words? Is that the sort of men you are? I ask only that you act upon the beliefs of which you have so strongly spoken and in which you so strongly believe. That our faith should not be just inside us, it should be coming out of us so that the world can see the faith that we profess is real, it is live, it is active, it is life-changing kind of faith. The truth for this morning is this, that when I engage His Word better, then I will engage my world better. Now think about that for a minute. If I engage God's Word better, I'm going to engage my world better. Now you can start from the other way and, and start asking questions. You know, I, I, I need better relationships. I wish I had a better job situation, a better relational situation, a better family situation. I wish I had a better friendship. I wish things could be better in all of these other kinds of areas. I wish my world would simply be better. And let me tell you, the truth today is this. You'll be able to engage your world better if we will start engaging His Word better. This is the truth for today. So join me in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 19 and following this morning. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for human anger doesn't accomplish God's righteousness. We could camp out here for quite a while, uh, because I don't know about you, but I, every time I read these two verses, things automatically come to mind, situations come to mind, if I'd only been slower to speak. If I had just kept my mouth shut longer, things might have been better. If I had been more patient, if I had been more kind, if anger hadn't been so quick to rise up in my reactions, things might have been better. There's three things I want you to note today. The first is this, that when we engage the Word of God, first of all, things are going to change. Our reaction is going to change. This is what he's saying here in these verses. Our reaction is going to change when we engage His Word. Why? Because if I engage His Word, then I will engage my world better. So my reactions are going to be better. The way that I react to people around me will be better. And so here's what he says. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. Let's just repeat it one more time for us. Quick to listen slow to speak, slow to anger. That can be hard. Because we all have an opinion. We all have an idea. And what happens more often than not, and I'm guilty of it as well, is we either don't really listen when somebody else is talking, or what happens is we're formulating the answer we want to say in the middle of what they're saying, and so we really don't know what they just said. Some of you are doing it right now. But we have to be quick to listen. We have to 
listen, as some would say, we have to actively listen to what is being said from the people that we love, even the people we don't love. We call them bosses. But anyway, um, we, we need to understand that we, we must be quick to listen, and that is a skill. It's a skill that you have to learn how to do, and sometimes it's harder than it may seem to listen without interrupting. This is active versus passive listening. Somebody can be just talking, and you have no idea what they're saying. All of a sudden, you realize, wait a minute, they're talking to me. What, wait, what did they just say? You, you know, and you, you may not know what's going on. If you actively listen, then you're listening with your heart and you're listening with your head. You are listening, you are engaged with what they're saying. In other words, I'm not considering my response yet. And see, we often do that. When it says to be quick to listen... It means that I need to not be formulating my response while they're talking. I need to be engaged in what they're saying. I need to be engaged in how they're saying it. I need to understand what they're saying. In fact, I might need to repeat what they have just said. So what I hear you saying is this. And you say, okay, that sounds like psychobabble. No, what it sounds like is exactly what Jesus would do oftentimes when he would teach. You've heard it said, but I say to you. So this is the way you understand it. Is this, am I right? Well, yes. Okay, then I want you to understand it this way. And so he would practice this, and yet we don't often do this. People are speaking their mind, sharing their opinion, and we just, we're formulating something else instead of trying to engage what they're saying, looking them in the eye, listening with our head and our heart, and being quick to listen and actively engaged in what they're saying to the point that we might repeat it. So what I hear you saying is this, and give them the chance then to respond. No, 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 that's not what I meant. How many times, how many times have you said something and then they have heard something completely different? How many of you have children? So you have experience. You see, we need to, this is, uh, Stephen Covey produced this years ago, a statement that I think fits here. Seek first to understand and then to be understood. And, you know, this is an important concept. If we're going to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, then we need to seek first to understand. What is it they're saying? What is it that person is trying to tell me? What is it that, that, they're, that they're saying without their words? What's their body language saying? I need to be engaged in what they're doing so that I can properly respond. Because if I'm not engaged in the process, then what I have just done is I've disengaged from that, and in doing that, I have disrespected them as a person. And you don't want to be disrespected as a person. I mean, we, we, wouldn't, we don't like to be interrupted, so we shouldn't do that. And we like to be heard, and so we should listen. And this is what the Bible is saying in a very practical way. Be quick to listen. Stop thinking about what you're going to say and just listen to what is being said. It, it is a small thing that has huge dividends in our relationships. When I, when I am in God's word, I am going to then take a verse like this and begin to apply it to my life, and that's going to make the way I engage my world even better. How much better would our relationships be if we actually did this? Compassion would rise from the ashes of apathy, and we would have character rising from the ashes of instability, because when I engage God's word, I engage my world better. And that, that is something that we don't always understand. We, we think, well, we have the Bible, and that's great, but then I have life to live. And what we need to understand is God's Word is not just for my quiet moment. God's Word is there for my life in the quiet moments and in the messy moments. My, God's Word is there for us in all aspects of our life, not just for church, but for everyday living. And this is one of those moments where James gets really practical and says, guys, you have got to learn how to listen without interrupting because we need to engage what's going on, engage God's word, engage those around us. The whole theme today is engagement, to be engaged in what is going on. 
And if you're not engaged, then all kinds of things can happen and problems can rise. So the first thing is going to happen is this. When I'm in God's Word, my reaction is going to change. So be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger. For human anger doesn't accomplish God's righteousness. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted Word which is able to save your souls. So we need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, ridding ourselves of this moral filth. When I'm in God's Word, then I'm going to engage my world better. And this is what we see here, that we're ridding ourselves of these things. We're living without this sense of immorality. How much better would our relationships be if we would rid ourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receiving the implanted Word which is able to save your soul? You see, we understand that I give my life to God and I make a decision of faith to say, yes, I believe that I'm a sinner. My life is completely broken. It's wrecked. I'm dead in my trespasses. But thanks be to God that in the midst of all of that, God, you gave Jesus to die on the cross for me so that my sins could be forgiven and that my life could be changed. So God, here's what I'm, I, I, I do in response to that truth. I'm going to give you everything, which absolutely is nothing. But I'm going to give you everything of me. I'm going to turn my life over to you. And in, in, in doing that, you take a hold. You take control. You have everything. You have it. Do with it what you want. I'm not holding back any portion of control. I'm going to give that all over to you. When we are doing that, then we understand that faith has has made us new, has changed us, has created us into a, a brand new person. But as you're going to learn tonight, in, in our session tonight, you're going to learn about what to do then and the process and the journey that goes on. And we'll, we'll see that at 5 o'clock. But for right now, what we need to understand is that we need to be receiving God's Word in our life. It's not a one-time, one moment in history, hey, I understood faith, I understood God's Word, that's great, now I'm saved, now, now it's over. It's not over. It begins at that moment. It begins right then. And we start a journey and we start a process. And what James is saying is we need to continually be receiving this word from God, this message from God, this, this indwelling of God, and let it change our lives so that our reactions will change, that we would be more humble and have humility rising up in our lives. Unlike... This individual, this young woman came to meet with the pastor and she said, Pastor, I ha I've got a real problem and, and I've got this sin and, and I'm very worried about it. And she said, okay, I've become aware of this sin in my life and I cannot control it. Every time I'm at church, I look around and I begin to look at other women and I begin to look at, at them and, and I realize that I'm just the prettiest one in the whole congregation. And none of the other women can compare to my beauty. What am I going to do about this sin? The pastor leaned back in his chair and he said, Well, I hate to tell you that's not a sin. That's just a mistake. <laughs> she had a pride issue. And it was causing her problems. Can you imagine how everybody else was feeling? Because you can't keep that kind of stuff to yourself. You see, when we engage in God's Word, we can engage our world better. And it begins with how our reactions change. But he goes on and he talks about how our recall is going to change. Look at this, verse 22. But be doers of the Word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Now look, because if anyone is a hearer of the Word and not a doer, he's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror for he looks at himself, goes away, immediately forgets what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not forgetful, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. So our reaction is going to change. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, cleansing our lives. But also... The second thing that's going to happen is our recall is going to change. He says, you know, what happens sometimes is like a, you go to the mirror and you look at yourself and you walk away. You, don't, you forget what you look like. 
Now, that doesn't happen in our generation today because we have 42,000 selfies on our phone and we all know what we look like. But back in the day, that didn't happen. And, and the mirrors really weren't as clean and clear as you might have it today. And so they'd walk away and they wouldn't, they, they, you know, you, okay, what, I don't know. You, you know, if, I don't know. I, I know what other people look like. I don't know what, I, I don't know. And so they would go away. And he's, he's equating that to how many of us treat God's word. That we will read it. And in fact, you may be an early riser or you may be a late night uh, person. And you'll read it, but two hours, four hours, six hours from then, if somebody were to say, hey, what would you read in the Bible today? Could you recall it? Because it's easy for us. We read it, but we don't engage it. Oh, well, I've read the words on the page, but I, I can't recall it. I don't, I, don't really, I don't really remember what I read. And what happens is that we're slowly moving into a process of hearing but not doing. We're disengaging. We're reading for the check mark rather than reading for the life change. And I encourage you, stop reading for the check mark and start reading for the life change. Because when we engage God's word, we'll engage our world better. And that's what we have to remember, is these things change. So the first thing that, that, that happens here is that there's a focal shift toward action. He says, don't be just hearers, but be doers of the word. Don't just listen and then walk away. I, I challenge you today, I challenge you today to not just listen to what's being said today, but to go and act on it, to go and act on it, to not just be hearers of the word and walk out and say, hey boy, that was, that was a great time in church today, but there's no life change as a result. See, that's what he's saying, don't be just hearers, go be doers of it. Hear the word of God, let it sink in, and then go and do the word of God to act on what you're hearing. So you have a focal shift toward action, but then you have also a focal shift toward intensity. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it, you've heard it and you're doing it, they are not a forgetful hearer, but a doer who works. Look at the result. The person will be blessed in what he does be blessed in what he does why because your relationships get better your work gets better your life gets better why because when you engage God's Word you can engage your world better so that things begin to change my reaction is changing I'm not reacting as poorly as I once did I'm not reacting as fast as I once did but I'm also recalling God's word in my life. And don't you think those things go hand in hand? I have, I, I have never enjoyed, this is truth and confession time, I have never really enjoyed or put into practice memorizing scripture. I can tell you scripture because I've been in it long enough over the years. I can tell you scripture, can't always tell you the address, and I can tell you scripture, but I've never really put into practice a, a process and a habit of memorizing scripture it's just not something that that I've done I've always I, I thought well you know it's it's more about you know actually just understanding it it's not actually about quoting it let me tell you where it comes into practice it comes into practice in those difficult moments it comes into practice in those tempting moments it comes into practice in all of these things because when my reaction is getting ready to jump faster than it's supposed to Recalling sort of what the Bible says is not the same as recalling exactly what the Bible says. Because the devil knows the difference. And he reacts poorly to the actual word of God, not my thoughts on the word of God. And it, it's a process that we use, and it's a focal shift of intently. If, I, if I'm looking into it with intention and intentionality, and I'm focusing on it, I will be blessed in what I do. So, two things that we've learned already. That if I'm in God's Word, my reaction is going to change, and also my recall is going to change. But third, and this is where it gets sticky, my religion's going to change. 
My religion's going to change. Now, it doesn't mean that you're going to quit the Baptist and go over to the Christian. It doesn't mean that you're going to quit one thing and go to another. That's, that's not the point. But the point is that we'll get back to what Jesus had in mind that, ha- that is more relationship-based and it is love and it's compassion more than the, than the rule of law. Because that's what the Pharisees were doing. They were doing the rule of law. They've lo- they had lost sight of everything. And Jesus would come. And, and Matthew 5, 6, and 7. You've heard it said, but I say to you. You've heard it said that this is how you should act. But I'm telling you, this is how you should act. And he's bringing back in this hearer-doer mentality. And he's bringing back in. Don't just look at the letter of the law. Look at the spirit of the law behind it. It's not just about, well, if you don't physically murder somebody, then you're okay. He's like, no, if you, if, if you even look at somebody with hatred and anger, it's the same thing. And he begins to expand the process and expand the understanding. And so when you look at verse 26 and 7, if anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless and he deceives himself. Now James is just really getting difficult to deal with here, isn't he? I mean, come on, dude. Can you not give us a break somewhere in these verses? I mean, you've already told me I have to stop talking and listen. Now you're telling me I have to control what I say. Yeah, we do. Because it's not about us. It's about God. And it's it's about, am I living out the name of God through my life? Am I carrying the name appropriately? If anyone thinks he's religious, and you think you're okay, but you can't control your tongue, you got a problem. And sometimes in our lives, we remove filters that need to be put back into place. Sometimes we remove them because of circumstances we've gone through. Like, hey, when you've gone through what I've gone through, you can say what you want to say. Not according to the Word of God. Well, when you get to the age I am, I can just say whatever I want to say. No, you can't. Well, you know, when I get older, I'll control it. No, start now. Sometimes filters leave us and we forget to put them back into place. You know what happens if you take a filter out of your air conditioning system and never put a filter back in place? Well, the, inside the machine is a thing called an A-coil, and that's where you've got all of the heating and cooling system that, that goes on, and, and air blows over that. Well, the filter is in place so that all the dust and debris that is in your house that comes up stops at the filter and doesn't wreak havoc on your system. But if you take the filter out and all that stuff is coming up, then you're going to have a problem inside the system and it's going to cost you a lot more than you thought a few filters were going to cost you. And so even though it it seems like a, you know, sometimes we can get conspiracy theories going all the time, can't we? Well, those air conditioner guys just, you know, they're in cahoots with the filter people. They just want me to buy filters every month because they're, they've got a thing going in their unions and they're all related. And somehow they're getting a kickback from the filter company. You laugh because you've thought it. <laughs> but if you don't put that in there and all this, this dust and grime doesn't seem like much in, in, the, in the first month or the first two months, and you might even go a few months, but over the course of time, the whole system's going to break down when a $2 filter could have saved you a lot of time, trouble, money, and heartache. The same goes with your mouth. Sometimes we forget to put filters on our mouth. Some of us need a muzzle. Some of you can get by with the filter. Some of you need some duct tape and bailing wire. (laughs) Because if anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion, look at this, his religion, what's it say? Is useless. Wow. You can have all the attendance pins you want, but it's useless. If we walk out of these doors listening without doing, it's all useless. You can rise to any level of position in church life. You can be thought of well, looked upon well, you can have been appreciated well, and you could rise to any any level you want in church life. But if we listen and don't do the Word of God, it is useless. What a waste of time. 
James is saying. What a waste of time if you listen but don't go do. And this is one of the things that should happen. We need to engage the Word of God. Engage the Word of God, not just for the check mark, but for the life change. How are you reading God's Word? How are you engaging God's Word? For the check mark or the life change? And this is ultimately what James is getting at here. So we look at, he tells them, pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is this. Look after orphans. In other words, look after those who are innocent. Those who are innocent and widows. Those who are alone in their distress. And that could be physically widows or it could be figuratively those who are alone. Figure, literally orphans, figuratively orphans, those who are innocent, those who are alone, and look after your own witness to keep oneself unstained from the world. Because when I engage his word, I'll engage my world better. Imagine how much better your relationships would be if we engaged God's word. Just think about that. Imagine how much better your neighborhood would be if we just engaged God's Word. How much better our work relationships would be if we would just engage God's Word. Not just listen, but action. To go and do the Word of God. So what is your do something this week? Engage the Word of God so that you can engage the world with the message of Jesus Christ. How can you do that? Well, one, if you haven't already, I highly suggest choose a reading plan. Because if we say I'm going to read, you know, if we make our annual New Year choice, well, I'm going to read through the Bible this year. You realize 80% of all choices are already over. I mean, we're on 13 days in. If you made a resolution or a choice, a whole lot of those have already been broken. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but you know who you are. Choose a reading plan. Well, I did. Let me help you understand something. This may free, this may free you today. It's not about perfection. It's about consistency. Well, I missed three days, so I guess it's all over. I'll start again January of 2020. Well, that was a nice idea for a week, but now it's over. Start again. Do it again. It's about consistent. Pick up where you left off and keep going. Well, but then I won't get through it all the way. Let me tell you, I rarely get through it all in a year. Why? I rarely get through it all in a year. Why? Because I get stuck looking at something and it's changing my life and I, and I keep coming back to that chapter and coming back to that chapter and I don't always get through it either. Why? Because it's not about perfection. We're not living for the check mark. We shouldn't be reading for it. We read for the life change. Choose a reading plan. Choose the next step. There in your, in your notes you've got the next steps of what we do here at First Baptist. That we want you to gather together and worship. And we want you to move from that stage to the next step. And the next step is to get into a Sunday school group. Get into that group of uh, 15 to 30 people and be in life with that group. And be able to go in, in relationship with them and build, relate, moving from anonymity to relationship inside the church body. But then we, we encourage you to go deeper, to take the next step and be a part of a, of a grow group, of what we call a D group. And I encourage you that if you are already in a Sunday school group and maybe you, you've wanted to go deeper, maybe you, you want to do more, you want to learn more, you want to be more this year, you, you want to take a message like this and say, I want to stop listening and start doing, and you're already coming to worship, you're already in a Sunday school class, here's what I want you to consider doing. Go to the next step. Go to the next step. And that is to get in this D group opportunity where four to six gender specific individuals come together. Four to six men get together every week for a year. Four to six ladies get together for a year for the purpose of reading God's word together, praying together, living together, understanding life together, and learning together, walking together in God's spirit so that we can grow together and be able to, to replicate that in the next year or the next year and a half and be able to go and do that with somebody else. 
It's not about how much you know, it's about who you know. And when we get in God's word and we engage God's word, God's going to change us and rearrange us and make us new and fresh and ready to go as we go and do God's word. It's not enough to just say, hey, I love the Great Commission. We want you to be a part of the Great Commission. And that is that you have heard the word of faith. You have word the, you've heard the understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have, many of you have responded to that. You've gathered together and you're in Sunday school groups. But let's go further and get intentional into God's word together. If that's something that you want to do, I, I encourage you, take one, take one of the cards or tear off a portion of your bulletin and put your name on it and say, yes, I want to be a part of a group like that. Put it in the offering plate later on. And we will gather those names up and we'll, we'll get you a guide. It's going to start at the beginning of next month. If you want to do that or maybe you've been approached by one of our, our guides already and you, you're on the, I don't know if I want to, if I don't want to, man, I don't know if I can commit to, to every week. Listen, consistency, not perfection. Consistency. It's a process. It's a journey. We just want to walk together in that journey. What is your do something this week? What is your doing of the word consist of this week? How is it that God wants to change your heart and your life today? It may be a decision of faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ as I talked about earlier, but it may be that you simply need to stop reading for the check mark and start reading for life change. Commit to getting in one of these groups so that we can grow together. Why? Why? Because when we engage His Word, you will engage your world better.